Let's break into it today. Isaiah 54, starting in verse 1, God is speaking to the people of Israel. Our promise scripture, it starts in verse 2 to verse 3, but I want to pick up in verse 1 today. It says this, sing, barren woman. Remember that right there. Barren woman, sing. That's not an easy thing to do is to sing in a barren state. It's hard to sing a song when you feel like you're unproductive. It's hard to praise when you feel like things are not working out. It's hard to praise when you feel like you're not fulfilling the purpose you have in life. But the Lord says, sing, barren woman. You who never bore a child burst into song. Shout for joy. Can we try that right now? Can you shout for joy? Come on, I think you could do better than shout for joy. That's it. You who were never in labor because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband, says the Lord. What a word right there. Here's our promise scripture. Enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch your tent curtains wide. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords. Strengthen your stakes for you will spread out from the right and to the left and your descendants will dispossess nations and settle in their desolate cities. Tell your neighbor the title of our message, The Designer's Desires. And you can take your seat where you are today. Here the Lord is speaking a word over the people of Israel, and he's also speaking it over our life as well this morning. That there's expansion going to take place in your life. That there's growth going to happen before your very own eyes. This is encouraging for many of us because some of us feel like we came into this place barren. Anybody relate with me today? Anybody been through a barren time? Barren times are not good times. I know my wife and I, actually, we were in a time of barrenness. It wasn't just spiritual or it wasn't just a barren time where we felt like we didn't have resource, we were lacking productivity. We were in a time where we were really barren, we couldn't bear child. We went through this season for a long time, years, believing God that one day he would give us a baby. And what's interesting is that in your barren time, what you want, people start getting. <laughs> That's rough. <laughs> Let's be real right now. In your barren time, what you see other people getting is the very thing you're believing for. And your heart is always tested in the barren season on what you do when you see other people getting what you feel God wants to give you. My wife and I believed God that we were going to have a baby. We prayed for it. We fasted for it. We see words over it. We see people encourage us on it, quoting scripture on it, believing, but nonetheless, we were barren. And next thing you know, every single person we know starts saying that they're pregnant. I mean, it was left, right, left, right on social media, on phone calls. It was in our family members, our friends, our team members. I said, goodness, everybody's pregnant. And we weren't. And I feel as though it's in the barren time that God was watching the heart. God was looking at the faith of us, not in our productive time, but in our unproductive time. And seeing whether or not we could celebrate other people when we feel like we're losing. How is our heart when people are getting the things we feel God wants to give to us? How is your song when you feel barren? How is your praise sound when you feel like you're in lack? How does your worship sound when you feel everything is breaking apart? How does your prayer sound when you feel like everybody's getting everything that God told you you were going to get? God is always watching us in the barren time. And I feel as though if ever there was a time that God had his eye on my wife and I, it was right there in that barren season. He was listening to the praise that came out of our mouth. He was listening to whether or not we could celebrate other people who have the things we feel God wants to bring to us. 
And in the barren time, my wife and I celebrated every single pregnancy announcement. We served in people's baby showers. We sewed in people's baby showers. We did everything we could do to celebrate the people who God was blessing. And sooner or later, God did give us our child. We now bear a child. God brought healing to my wife. And he restored her. And he gave us a baby girl, Syra. She's in nursery right now. Praising God. She's a miracle. But it was an unproductive time for us. Just as many of us, maybe our unproductivity is not just in the area of giving child, but in life. In business. In our career in our spiritual growth, in the productivity of life, we as well could find ourselves in a place where we feel like we're not producing. And this is where the people of God were in a barren time where they did not have productivity, they lacked fruit, and everyone around them seemed to be fruitful. Other nations seemed to be getting blessed. Other nations seemed to be expanding, but Israel was barren. And it was in that barren time where God spoke this promise over them the same way God speaks this promise over you. You're going to be productive. Your barren season is coming to an end. Your unproductive season, the expiration date has hit its mark. It is a new day. It's a new time. It's a new hour. And it's a new you that's going to arise and be productive in areas you weren't productive. Somebody give God praise like you believe that could happen by the power of God. God has the power to change it like that. He could turn a situation around in the blink of an eye. He doesn't need to take you through 12-step program, six-month program. In the snap of a finger, God could shift everything for you. He could turn the tide. He could change everything from unproductive to productive. And this promise is a promise God spoke over Israel, he spoke it over our ministry, is that we are stepping into a productive and a time where we're going to expand. I receive that. That's why we're standing here in Hollywood. That's why our team has assembled from different parts of the United States, because we believe in the promise of God. And we believe that here in Hollywood... We're going to see God bring that promise to fulfillment. We're already witnessing it right now before our very own eyes, and you're a part of it today. Tell your neighbor, I'm a part of it. The Lord says that they were going to be productive. They were going to bear children, and that the children they bore were going to dispossess nations of the world. But in order for Israel to expand and to see the fulfillment of the promise come to pass, they had to recognize what God recognized. There's three desires I discovered in studying the scripture of Isaiah 54 that I want to bring out to each and every one of you today. The first desire I find of God, the designer's desires, God is the designer. I'm not talking about designer product, okay? God is the creator, the designer of everything we see. The first desire is this, that God desires growth. He said, sing because you were barren, but now you're going to bring forth children. He was saying that you were not growing before, but sing a song and shout for joy because you're going to start growing today. He told them, burst into song because growth is going to take place. Look at what it says in Luke 15, 10. The Bible says that there is rejoicing in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. Let us never take it lightly when someone gets saved. The Bible says that when one comes to the Lord, angels rejoice. And the original language of that, listen to this, they rejoice like it never happened before. They rejoice like it was the very first time that they seen someone get saved. How was your rejoicing when you won your first soul? That's the kind of rejoicing we should have every single time somebody says the prayer, the sinner's prayer, we should rejoice like it's the very first time we've ever heard it before. It says angels rejoice at the sound of, of one sinner who repents like it never happened before. I know in Hollywood we've been having heaven rejoice because people have been getting saved in this building. 
You have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and when you said that prayer, you had heaven clapping. The Bible says heaven rejoices at the sound of one sinner who repents. God says in the scripture, I want you to sing because you're barren, but now you're going to bring forth children. God was expressing a desire that he had for his people, and that is that growth would take place in the people in the nation of Israel. God's heart, his heart yearns that people could be reached. His heart yearns that your family would be saved. His heart yearns that your loved ones would be saved. We think at times we're the only one who feels it. No, God shares that burden with you. He sees the pain that people around you endure. He sees the struggle that your loved ones face. And the same way you feel a burden, God fills that very same burden with you and he shares with it with you. And many times he actually, he fills it first, then he lets us fill it. And he wants to see growth happen through repentance and through seeing people be saved. And he wants you to be a part of that growth. Can you say amen to that today? In Hebrews 2.10, the Bible says, for this reason, Jesus suffered, bled, and died that he may bring many sons into glory. God's desire has always been and will always be growth. Somebody say grow. He desires growth to happen. See, the growth that we want to happen around us, it takes place inside of us first. Isn't that a fact here today? That when we begin to grow on the inside, next thing you know, things start to grow on the outside. The growth we want to see in our lives, it takes place within us first. A growing person will produce growing ministries. A growing person will produce growing businesses. A growing person will see growth happen because they're growing inside. Let me ask you a question. Are you growing on the inside? We all in this place, we have to recognize that growth is a choice. It doesn't matter if you're growing older in age. The question is, are you growing older on the inside? Are we growing on the inside? We could be growing on the outside, but are we growing on the inside? As you begin to grow on the inside, I want you to know everything around you will start growing. Because you've made a decision to not stay where you are, to grow on the inside so you can see God grow what you have on the outside. Growth takes time. God makes a mushroom, he takes six hours. He takes 60 years when he builds an oak tree. Growth takes effort, it takes a commitment. Growth takes change. You have to decide, I'm going to change. Growth takes help. You need people around you in your life that are going to help you become all that God has destined you to be. Here's the truth here today. Personal growth is that when you stop growing, that's an indicator you're dying. When you start dying, is that's in a place where you stop growing. When you are living, you're growing. Your body could technically stop growing, but that doesn't mean your spirit man needs to stop growing. There's people who I see their body is not growing no more, but their spirit, man, their spirit is growing. Because on the inside, there's growth taking place. Anybody made a decision, you're going to grow. No matter what phase in life you're in, you are not going to stay the same. You're committed to grow. Each of us today, we make a decision whether or not we're going to see what God sees and make a decision to grow on the inside. I feel as though in every year we live, we should have an evaluation, self-reflection, and make changes and reintroduce ourselves every single year. It's a terrible thing if you're the same person this year you were last year. It's 2024, and if you're still doing the same things you still did in the past, it's a sad place to be. People who are excelling and growing in life every year, they're a new person. Every year, they make new choices. Every year, they're making changes. Every year, they're making adjustments. Every year, they're reintroducing themselves. It's a scary place to be if you don't have to reintroduce yourself to people. You know when you first get saved, people say, wow, you are growing. Oh, my goodness, you're not the same person I once knew. 
You are different. You talk different. You live different. You lead different. You preach different. You sing different. You serve different. You give different. There's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's an outside reflection of an inward transformation. And every single year, we should have those conversations with people. Say, I'm not the same person I used to be. I don't talk the way that I used to talk. I don't do the things I used to do. That was in my past, but I'm moving forward to my future. And my past is not sufficient for my future. So if I talk different, I give different, I live different, I serve different, let me reintroduce you to the man and the woman that God is building you up to be. It's time we reintroduce ourselves to people because of all the change that's happening on the inside. It's a scary thing if people just say, yeah, you're the same person I knew five years ago. I don't want to be in that place. Please resurrect my life if you find me doing the same old things I used to do, talking the same way I used to talk. You going to help me out if I do that, all right? We're going to help you out if you do that too. We should grow in our life. We should grow in our character. We should grow in our being. We should grow in our ministry, grow in our mentality. We should desire growth to take place the way God wants to see it done in our life. Here's a true thing today. What will grow in your life is the thing you focus on. If you keep focusing on your pain, your pain's going to grow. You keep focusing on your problems in life, they're going to grow in your life. If you keep focusing on your mistakes, they're going to grow in your life. But if you start focusing on your destiny, that's going to grow in your life. You start focusing on your skill, that's going to grow in your life. You start focusing on your purpose, that's going to grow within your life. What you focus on will maximize in your life. And many times we make the mistakes of focusing on the wrong things. And we maximize the things we need to minimize. When God wants to shift our paradigm that we could focus on the things that are important. Focus on God. Focus on his word. Focus on his purpose that he has for our life. You start to focus on that next thing, you know, you're going to see it grow in your life. You start to focus on your ministry, it's going to start to grow. You start focusing on your family, it's going to start to grow. You start focusing on your character, guess what? It's going to start to grow. What you focus on will grow. So let's make sure we focus on the right thing. Somebody clap your hands if you agree with me this morning. If we're not changing, what will happen is we'll constantly have to give out apologies. I just told a leader recently who called me, they said, my apologies. And this is already an area we've been working on with the individual about and, and the changes that need to be made, adjustments that need to be made. And, and uh, you know, discipleship, we have to at times deal with people. And I told them, listen, I don't want apologies. I want adjustments. And it came to reality to me is that if we don't make adjustments, we'll constantly have to give out apologies. And the less amount of, of adjustments you make, the more amount of apologies you have to give. So if we find ourselves constantly apologizing over something we should have changed a long time ago and grew out of a long time ago, we need to recognize we didn't make the adjustments we needed to make in our past to take us to a place in our future where we're not apologizing for the same thing we've been apologizing for for 20 years. Some of us have areas we should be growing out of. We should have areas we've already overcome. We should have areas in our life where we got victory over, but we haven't made the adjustments that need to be made. So we're constantly apologizing to new people. The more adjustments you make, the less apologies you have to give. We need to adjust if we want to grow. Somebody say, I'm making adjustments in this place. I'm making adjustments. We need to adjust that we could see growth take place within our life. Grow in our personal lives. We believe as though God is going to grow you. This promise he gave to us, it applies to us personally as well. That you're going to see God bring growth to your family. God bring growth to your ministry. You watch in this place the magnitude of ministries that God is going to use you to lead. It's going to impact not just Hollywood and the people that step into your ministry, but it is going to impact the entire world. 
the magnitude of the ministry God is going to use you to grow, it's going to have an influence beyond your way of thinking, beyond whatever you thought was a high mark. He's going to break through the roof and use it beyond what you ever seen, dreamed, imagined. He's going to bring growth to our ministry. Can you say amen like you're excited for it this morning? I also believe he's going to bring growth to your businesses. We believe as though you could do ministry and also do business as well. It's biblical. But let me just touch it real quick. Paul was a person who was a tent maker, but he also was a person who was a team builder. Paul had a successful career in tent making, and he talks about it in Acts 20. He says, I haven't coveted no one's silver or gold. He says that, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities for those who are with me. It's in Acts 20, 33-34. He said, I've had my tent making business and I've used it to help me in the kingdom business. He said the kingdom business was connected to the personal business. And he had both. He did both. Just like you could do both as well. But Paul understood something that we need to understand and that is that we shouldn't get more excited about personal business than we do about kingdom business. Paul had the business just like Peter had a business. He had multiple boats, successful fishing business. But Paul talked more about kingdom business than he did about personal business. Paul was excited not just about personal business as much as he was about kingdom business. Let me speak over you today. It is vital that we do not lose sight of what God has called us to do, who he's called us to be, and not get caught up in this temporary life that we have on this earth. This life is but a vapor. It's gone in a moment. But what we do with what we have over here on this earth will determine what we carry with us into eternity. Are you still excited about kingdom business? Are you still excited about growing and building up the kingdom of God? I need to wake some people up today. I said you have an opportunity to partner with kingdom business and build up the kingdom of God and give God glory with whatever he's entrusted you with. You have an opportunity to serve him with it. He was excited, not just about building tents, but also about building teams. Jesus told Peter, you were a fisher of fish. I'm going to make you a fisher of men. And I'm sure Peter talked more about faith than he did about fish. I'm sure he talked more about Jesus walking on the water than fish swimming under the water. Because he knew he had to do both. But the kingdom business never loses important. The first things first, the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things shall be added unto you. There's a story of Alexander the Great. He had three last wishes when he was going to die. He told them, the people who are going to be at his funeral, tell my physicians and doctors to carry my coffin when I die. He said, I also want my coffin when it is transported to the grave, on the path leading up to the graveyard, I want all my wealth to be laid out on the floor. And he said, my third request is that when you lay out my coffin, I want my hands to be outside the coffin. And they asked him, why do you have all these requests? What kind of funeral do you want to have? And he said, I want to display a lesson to the people who are at my funeral. I want them to learn some lessons. He said, I want the physicians to carry my coffin because everyone should realize that no doctor can cure anybody. And they're helpless in the face of death. He said, I want all my earnings to be laid out on the ground to show everyone that I can't take it with me in the grave. And he said, I want everyone to know as my wealth is laid on the dust that that's exactly what it is, nothing but dust. And he said, lastly, I want my hands to be on the outside to show every single person who shows up to my funeral that empty-handed you step into this world and empty-handed you leave this world. But we know something Alexander didn't know, and that is that what we do for the kingdom of God, we carry with us into eternity. 
Let me say that one more time for you. What we carry into the kingdom of God is the things we do for the kingdom of God. They carry with us and transfer with us when we step into eternity. God wants growth. He desires growth. Somebody say, I want to grow. Secondly, God desires change. This promise God made to the people, it's, a, it's something called a bipartisan promise. And that is that there's God's part, but there's also our part. There's promises that God makes that he just totally does them. And there's nothing, it, it's, it's, it's not contingent on what you do. But there's bipartisan promises where there's God's part and then there's your part. And this promise is a bipartisan promise. God does his part when we do our part. God told the people, he said, make room. Lengthen your course. Strengthen your sakes. He said, expand from the right and to the left. Make room because growth is going to come, but you need to be prepared for the growth I'm about to bring. God told them, you do your part, I do my part. He told them to do three things. First thing he said, he says, stretch the curtains. First thing they had to do was they had to learn to step into stretching. Stretching, the process of stretching is not similar to the way we perceive it. They didn't have the type of stretch fabric that we have today. When you talk about stretching in biblical times, it's talking about taking off old material and putting on new material. Talking about finding on the tent that they had the old pieces of cloth that were damaged and broken and no longer sufficient for covering. Recognizing it, identifying it, taking it off and putting on new material that is sufficient for the covering that they wanted to have. It talks about removing and replacing insufficient areas and replacing it with sufficient areas that are going to cover us. Here's the thing that I find very interesting about that is it talks about areas that many times we don't see because it's places on the side of us. Whenever there's a thing that needs to be replaced and removed within your life, many times we don't even see it. But when we have voices of people who keep it real with us, they'll help us see it. It's important to understand that you have blind spots the same way I have blind spots. And there's areas that we have been living with that aren't sufficient to the growth that God wants to bring in our life. And many times we don't see it, but someone else next to us will see it. And how many of you thank God for leaders who don't just let you walk around with messed up pieces on your life? How many of you are grateful for real friends who are going to tell you when you need to change? How many of you have people in your circle who call you out on stuff that contradicts your message? How many of you are grateful for that person that keeps it real with you when you don't want to hear what they have to say, but nonetheless they love you so much to tell you you need to change? I thank God for people who hold me to my character. I thank God for people who call me out when I'm out of line. I thank God for people who show me areas I didn't know existed in my life. I thank God for people who keep it real with me. Even when I was not, even before I got saved, I always wanted people who were going to help me grow in life around me. Even more so as a believer now, as a servant of God, I want people in my circle who are going to call me out and keep it real with me that I could become all that God has called me to be. How about you today? How many of you say, I want that in my life? Be careful. You're raising your hand. They're going to call you out. <laughs> There's some things that need to be taken off and put on that we could experience growth. One of them is selfish thinking. Selfish thinkers never think about people. All they think about is self. And instead of putting God first, they have a tendency to put themselves first. They think me, myself, and I. That is a fleshly mentality. Jesus, he said, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. When Jesus enters into your life, something shifts. For me, it's, it's no longer about me as much as it is about people. That's an indicator that God is doing something in your life is where you're not just concerned about you, yourself, and I, but you start getting concerned about people, thinking about people, thinking how to serve people, thinking how to raise people up, thinking about how to help people, thinking about how you could benefit others. Anybody got people on their mind? Anybody think about people? God's at work on you. That will begin to happen in your life. And selfish thinking will leave your life. 
Another thing that needs to leave our life and be removed off of our life is small thinking. Many times the spiritual growth isn't the growth that we want to see take place isn't a spiritual problem as much as it is a mentality problem. We think small. Small thinking needs to be taken off of us. Somebody say amen to that today. We need to think big. Another way of things that need to be taken off of us is a scarcity thinking. I don't have enough. I'll never be enough. I'll never possess enough. If you have God in your life, you have more than enough to do what he's called you to do. When God calls us to something, he empowers us for it. And when he sends us, he supplies us. So you may see it as maybe not enough in your own way of thinking, but God sees it as more enough. What you have in your hand, what he put in your life is more than enough for him to use you in a great way. Someone clap your hands like you agree with me today. We need to change. We need to strengthen, lengthen, and we need to stretch. I'm going to go to my final part of the message today. Is the third desire of God. God not only, not only desires growth and change, but God desires territory. God told them, I'm going to grow you, and I'm going to bring children to your house and children to your life. Not so you could just grow, but it's so that they could start to go. He said that growth is going to happen and your tent's going to be full because you're going to send people out to different nations. It exposes and it reveals God's desire for spiritual territory to be dispossessed. Each and every one of you today, I want to let you know that there's spiritual territory for you to take a hold of. God has set out territory for you to dispossess in your life. He's calling you to take hold of it. And he's mapped it out for you when he created you in your mother's womb. He knew exactly all the territory he was going to call you to take dominion over. And he wants you to see it so that you could dispossess it. Here's the thing about the spiritual territory God calls us to take. It needs to be dispossessed. The Bible says that he says, your descendants will dispossess nations. Let me talk to you. The process of dispossession is kicking out the person who's acting like the property's theirs when it's really yours. How would you feel if you go home and someone's in your house saying, this is my house? You go to your car, someone's sitting on your car, this is my car. I know you thought you had the keys, but this is my car. And I'm driving up to my house. How would you respond to that person? What type of attitude would you have? What type of frustration would you carry? What type of aggressiveness was, would you have? See, dispossession, it talks about the enemy being in territory that's really yours, but acting like it's his. The spiritual territory God has called you to, there's an enemy standing in that territory telling you it belongs to him. But it's time you recognize, no, that belongs to me and God has given me dominion over and I'm going to dispossess it. What does that mean? I'm going to wage war against every single thing that stands on territory that God has called me to take. I'm going to kick it out and take possession of it. There's an enemy standing over your family saying that it belongs to him. There's an enemy standing over your destiny saying that that destiny doesn't belong to you. That destiny belongs to somebody else. And it's time for you to wake up and say, no, here and no more. I'm making a decision to take possession of what belongs to me. And give the devil the boot out of the territory. He's acting like his is really yours. And we can't live in a posture where we don't desire spiritual territory in our life. There is territory, there's physical territory we're going to take here from Hollywood. We believe that it's not just spiritual territory, also physical territory that we're going to send people out all over the entire world to take possession of territory that belongs to God. We're going to see God use us to send people out to reach that people, to reach those nations all over the world. But right now today, I feel as though that, that dispossessor mentality needs to get inside of you. 
The temptation that the people face that God said in the scriptures that during the time where it's time to dispossess, that people are going to have a temptation to hold back. He said, don't hold back. Lengthen your course, strengthen your stakes, for you're going to span to the right and to the left. Then he says this, is that you're going to dispossess. And then people are going to settle in desolate cities. Remember this, dispossession always comes before settling. But settling always wants to steal the desire to dispossess out of your life. Be careful you don't settle when God wants you to dispossess. There should be a hunger for new territory awoken inside of your life, an appetite for greatness stirring up in the center of your being that you want to do all you could do for God's glory and for God's honor, and you want to do it now. He said you're going to dispossess the nations. I want you to stand all over this place. A dispossessor says, I'll do whatever it takes. Settler says, I'll only do what I'm asked to do. A dispossessor assumes responsibility. A settler assumes that someone else will do it. A dispossessor feels privileged to be a part of the movement. A settler feels entitled to the benefits of the movement. A dispossessor expects personal sacrifice. A settler expects personal comfort. A dispossessor sees problems and seeks solutions. A settler sees problems and complains. A dispossessor sees possibilities and dreams of what could be. A settler sees barriers and reasons to quit. A dispossessor steps out with a radical trust in God. A settler sits satisfied and the stability of ministry. I want to ask you today, are you ready to dispossess the territory God has assigned to your life? Are you ready to take hold of every single place and people God is calling you to reach? I'm asking you a question, are you ready? Are you excited? Are you focused? Do you feel a sense of urgency to take hold of all the things that God wants to do within your life. It's calling you to dispossess territory for you, territory for us. God is going to use us in a mighty, mighty way. He's going to use you in a great way. But here's the thing. God's desires, they have to become your desires. God says, I want growth. I want change. And I want you to take territory. But the question is, have his desires become your desires? Because life always wants to strip those desires out of us. Pressure wants to take it out of us. Complacency wants to rip it out of us. Fear wants to take it out of us. But I hope you hear the word of the Lord today. I hope you hear the voice behind the voice today. God wants to bring growth unto you. He wants to change you and he wants to use you. He wants to raise you up and he wants to use your life. He's gonna use you to bring growth. He's gonna use you to bring change and he's gonna use you to take territory. You watch from this place, we're taking territory. We're taking territory from the entertainment system. We're taking territory from the educational system. We're taking territory in government. We're taking territory in careers. We're taking territory in colleges. We're taking territory in sports. We're taking territory in every single system that is surrounding us. We're gonna take territory from it because there's men and there's women this morning who know that God has given them a promise and the promise maker is a promise keeper. And if he said it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen. And he wants to use you to be a part of these moves he's gonna be making. I hope today you make a choice to allow the desires of God to be your desires inside of you. Close your eyes, lift up your hands all over this place. Come on, right there where you are, lift up your hands.